Hello, hi everybody. Uh, I am Alex uh, Keel. Uh, I'm co-mentored by Justin Siegel at UC Davis and Patrick Shee at UC Berkeley. And today we'll be talking about understanding the evolution of Rubisco oligomeric state. So, as was alluded to in the previous talk, uh, Rubisco is kind of important. Um, it's the second part of photosynthesis that fixes uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and incorporates that into biomass. Uh, but what people often think about Rubisco is kind of a structure like this, this huge mechanistically biochemically complex thing. Um, but hopefully by the end of the talk, maybe I will have uh, changed your mind on that. Uh, so another fun fact about Rubisco is approximately 92% of the carbon in your body has gone through Rubisco at some point and also approximately the same percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere uh, is produced by Rubisco. And we can see this kind of like on an evolutionary time scale at the bottom here, where we have carbon dioxide in red and then oxygen increasing uh, in blue as the uh, essentially mechanistic and biochemical complexity of Rubisco uh, increases as time passes. So when I started my PhD, this is kind of how we thought about Rubisco oligomeric state. You have your form one Rubiscos at the top. Uh, this is that nice uh, large 16 subunit structure with eight large subunits and eight small subunits. And then right before I started my PhD, we recently discovered the form one prime structures. Uh, so these are essentially a derivative of the form one rubiscos where they only have the large subunits and the small subunits have not yet been incorporated. And then we knew a little bit about these kind of uh, what I like to call weird rubiscos. Uh, so once again, we have no small subunits. The form one's the only one with the small subunit. And then we have a dip, some uh, archaeal and bacterial rubiscos. So what I want to bring your attention to, if it will, there is form two rubisco. So when looking at kind of understanding oligomeric state, uh, form two is kind of a particularly interesting clade of rubisco, specifically at this time around 2020, okay? Um, so right around my PhD, they published this paper, uh, uh, the BD et al 2020. And what they did is they characterized 143 form two and form two, three rubiscos. Uh, leading form two to be the most characterized clade other than form one. Uh, but what's also interesting as far as oligomeric state is that you have uh, both dimeric, which is the basic functional unit of rubisco. Essentially, you have two monomers forming in a kind of D2 symmetry uh, where you have active sites, two active sites forming on the intermonomeric interface. And then as well, you have a uh, a hexamer, which is like a C3 symmetry of dimers. So we've already talked about this a lot, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail of how it works, uh, but essentially for oligomeric state characterization, we're using this uh, seek sac smalls pipeline here at the beam line. And just for an example of kind of what the output data looks like for Rubisco from this, uh, we have our uh, scattering profile and the colored, as well as our theoretical fit in uh, red. Okay, so before we go into kind of like all of this nitty gritty stuff about specifically Robisco oligomerization, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to kind of talk about why proteins oligomerize in the first place. And the leading theory is that essentially through evolution and random mutations, you'll end up with kind of these uh, hydrophobic patches that will kind of force the protein to oligomerize and stabilize. And as long as this oligomerization doesn't affect the activity, typically this can be retained through evolution. And with these hydrophobic patches, it's very unlikely for it to go back to a monomer throughout evolutionary time. Another thing that can happen is that you can have these hydrogen bond networks, uh, where, which is similar to what we see, but this is actually uh, reversible. So as an example, we see this uh, form two clade here, 
Uh, we have form two, three as an out group, but all of these different colors. So um, purple, for example, is hexameric rubisco and blue is dimer rubisco. And there's a tetramer rubisco as well that I won't be talking about in this talk, but we have this hexameric clade where we almost exclusively see hexameric rubiscos. But then we have this dimer hexamer clade where we can see that ancestral nodes are hexamer, but then they revert to dimer. So to kind of understand what's going on in this form two clade, Albert, who was mentioned earlier, uh, really wanted to start to investigate this. So his idea was, well, why don't we break one of these hexamer rubiscos and see what happens? Uh, so this was the rubisco that he decided to pick. It's a uh, Gallinella species rubisco. So this comes from like soil bacterium. Um, and what he did is that he used protein contact atlas here, which is essentially showing uh, interacting residues between uh, chains. And this is between chains of the uh, dimer subunits, not between the monomers themselves. Uh, and then from there, he was able to identify uh, a, num a couple residues that he thought were really important. And specifically, he focused on uh, hydrogen bonding and salt bridges. So again, he's trying to go from a hexamer to a dimer. And then here you can see where on the interface uh, these mutations occurred. And these are single point mutations uh, that are essentially targeting the hydrogen bond network on the interface of the protein. And then over here, you can see the wild type scattering profile shown in this bright purple, and then both single point mutations showing the uh, conversion of the protein to a uh, dimer. So essentially from this, we learned that hydrogen bonds are probably really important for the visco interface, which sounds very intuitive, but now we have pretty hard experimental data to support that hypothesis. So the next thing we wanted to do was, now that we know how to take these things apart, we wanted to know, well, can we put them together? So that's what we did. Uh, so essentially, uh, we modeled the dimer to hexamer transition using Rosetta. Uh, so the first step in this process was to identify homologs with divergent oligomeric states, shown here in the, the red box. And then from there, we can look at uh, residues that essentially what you need is a high sequence percentage homolog with different oligomeric states, then you can look at residues that are different from where the interface would be on the dimer compared to where it is on the hexamer. And then from there, we did an in, uh, in silico systematic mutagenesis of the selected residues, which gave us uh, 128 newtons total. And then, so essentially how that works is for each residue position, the residue identity is allowed to be uh, either the hexameric representative or the dimeric representative. And then we tested all possible combinations of our selected residues. And then from there, we purified a small subset and went on to the oligomeric state uh, determination. And we were able to find something that worked. Uh, so with only seven met, uh, residue muta mutations on the interface, we were actually able to convert a dimer rubisco into a hexameric rubisco. And what's kind of interesting here is that, uh, notice that I have three curves here, not just two. So what we think is happening is that we were actually kind of able to capture that moment in evolutionary time where a rubisco could be changing to a higher order oligomeric state because we had a population of rubiscos that were dimers, but also a population of rubiscos that were hexamer from the same sample. Uh, so uh, essentially using this size exclusion method, we were able to separate the two and get uh, individual uh, data points for each of them. Another thing that's very interesting is that we didn't just recreate the interface that was found on the hexamer. We created a completely novel interface. Uh, so here you can see we actually solved the crystal structure of the hexamer. Uh, that way we had real, really good atomic resolution uh, data to be able to uh, do our modeling and validate our models. 
And then here we can see a number of new or a new possible new interaction uh, occurring here that's mainly due to um, positioning that residue in the right location to be able to form that new interaction. Okay, so, so far I've only talked about Form 2 Rubisco. Um, and the name of the talk was Understanding the Oligomeric State Evolution of Rubisco. So what about the rest of them? Uh, so during the time in my PhD, there's been some developments, uh, specifically in this area here, where we're looking at different derivatives of the Form 1 Rubisco. Um, essentially, this is kind of trying to understand how that L8 geometry became incorporated and uh, necessary for photosynthetic life. Uh, there's also been some developments in the Form 3B area, and these are our keel rubisco. But we really wanted to understand the whole tree. Um, so what we did was we had a, have a library of 102 uh, novel rubiscos that are shown in red, and we started to characterize all of them. Uh, and this, there's no, like we did all of them uh, at pretty large scale protein expression. Of the 102, I was able to get soluble uh, expression from E. coli with 18 of them with a pretty wide distribution over the tree. Um, one of the reasons that we think that a lot of these weren't able to express is just because we're not able to uh, recreate the exact like cellular environments um, in an in vitro system. Um, so, and a lot of these are from archaea and very weird anaerobic bacteria. So the next thing that we wanted to do was make sure that these things are active. because a lot of these came from like metagenomic mining. So we partnered up with a uh, gnome from the Savage Lab uh, who has a qualitative qualitative in vivo activity assay for Robisco. And essentially how this works is they were able to engineer a E. coli strain that's Robisco dependent. And then from this rubisco dependent E. coli strain, you can essentially get uh, rough kinetic information uh, from the growth rates. So from that, we were able to determine uh, that only two of our rubiscos had activity below the limit of detection, uh, but most of them had marginal activity and one uh, had very high activity in the form two clade. Um, but the next thing that we were interested in is understanding the oligomeric states. So we did SACs on all of these using the SACs Smalls pipeline. And what was very surprising, at least to me, is that almost all of them were dimers, especially if we're only looking in these areas that were previously unknown clades. Everything is a dimer, whereas everything with a higher order oligomeric state here and here are in known forms and the oligomeric state is uh, what we would expect it to be for those forms. So from this, it's really interesting because when I started, I said, you know, form two is the only one that has an L2 rubisco, but now it's kind of looking like these L2 rubiscos, the smallest functional unit of rubisco are kind of populated throughout the entire tree. Um, so as we think about like the complexity of Rubisco and we tend to think about these guys, I'm starting to wonder if maybe we should be thinking about these guys more if we really want to understand like how this thing works, how oligomerization uh, affects the Rubisco, uh, but more importantly, if we want to find good candidates for engineering. Um, because for engineering Rubisco, if we're able to get a 2x increase in the speed, or in like kinetic activity, um, then we'll probably also see that same increase in the rate of growth in plants if we're able to incorporate in that in plants would, would help with a food shortage, would also help with um, fertilizer use because we're essentially using the same land space for uh, twice as many plants. So in conclusion, uh, higher order oligomeric state can be, or engineering can be used to better understand Robisco evolution and kind of how that affects oligomeric state. Um, maybe dimeric Robisco is more common than we thought. 
and maybe Rubisco isn't as complex as we tend to think that it is. Uh, some future directions that I'm pretty excited about is doing a more quantitative kinetics assay. That way we can kind of really better understand the uh, catalytic space of these novel rubiscos and these novel clades, um, as well as looking at the genomic context of the rubisco. Um, this will kind of let us look at what these organisms are using it for, whether it's like the normal uh, Calvin Vincent Banson cycle or uh, nitrogen scavenging or methionine pathways. Uh, these things do essentially an enolation reaction. So there's a lot of fun biochemistry that they can be involved in. Um, another thing would be ancestral re sequence reconstruction. And this would kind of allow us to find that very early ancestral rubisco and kind of say definitively all rubiscos came from this timer state and they didn't evolve independently of um, other 10 barrel proteins. And with that, I just want to thank a couple people. So, uh, of course, both of my PIs, Justin Patrick, as well as Albert, who taught me everything I know about Rubisco protein uh, purification and expression, uh, known for helping out with the activity assays. And then uh, Miguel and me and Joshua here at Sybils, uh, which really helped with the SACs and worked with me working with this frustrating protein. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, I open up any questions and thank you guys for your time. Sorry, I think it's cause is like really sick in front of you. Yeah. So it has cause. Oh, no. uh, okay. Um, that reconstruction of ancestral sequences seems very interesting. Yeah. So do you, on your big clade of all these, do you have like a particular node that you're looking at more closely than others? Um, so we haven't started on yet. We're not sure if we actually want to do it or if we need to do it for kind of the scope of the paper. Um, but essentially, I would be looking at kind of this area here, because uh, what I didn't mention is that these form four rubiscos, they're not really active as rubiscos. These are known as rubisco-like proteins. And these are mostly found in like methionine pathways. So kind of what we're interested in finding is like, how does it go from essentially catalyzing and being used for very, very ancient methionine path pathways to central metabolism in almost everything. So you would expect maybe one of these nodes would have both activities, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Just kind of like a low specificity type thing and was kind of be skewed in one evolutionary trajectory as compared to another. Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, you have those different um, confirmations there for all the different forms. Like, does catalytic activity change based on the confirmations? Like, is one of them better than the other at doing the catalysis? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, we don't really have enough data to be able to, like, support that statistically. Um, we do see that the... Uh, specifically like form two rubisco, which used to be known as the only dimers. Um, they tend to be very fast, like your, your fastest rubiscos that are in recorded history are in this plate. Uh, whereas up here, you tend to have things that are somewhat slow, uh, especially in plants. Cyanobacteria are a little bit faster because they have the carbon concentrating mechanism. Um, but Short answer is no. Uh, I don't think there's enough data to support something like that. In, in your presentation, you mentioned anaerobic, uh, I think it was anaerobic bacteria that have a rubisco. Mm -hmm. I quite often couldn't kind of compare myself rubisco and anaerobic bacteria. Did it really require for some metabolic activities? I mean, I, yeah, so actually the, the one that I was mentioning specifically is the fastest rubisco. 
Uh, I like to call it fast Gallianella because it also came from a Gallianella species bacteria. And um, it's really interesting because it's extremely fast, at least in terms of Rubisco, but it's not specific at all. Uh, because Rubisco can interact with, uh, use carbon so dioxide as a substrate or oxygen. oxygen. But there's no oxygen interaction at all between in that Rubisco type. Of yeah, exactly. So, so we think that it hasn't evolved any sort of like specificity. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit more about your um, sequence to tube of protein for SACS data collection? And sequence to protein for SACS data collection. Like you got this huge list uh -huh. and you tried 150. Like what's your pipeline like in terms of you guys order from, you know, gene script? Yep, and then, yep. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so essentially we got this library through JGI. Uh, they tested out one of their synthesis methods on us, so we got it for free, essentially. Um, so we had this library of a bunch of genes. Uh, we, I expressed everything in E. coli, and we used kind of a co-expression system where we also expressed the chaperone, GROEL, or GROEL, ES, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then from Is there... Leader, leader? Size. Yeah, so I do test expression at 500 mil cultures uh, because these rubiscos are finicky. And essentially, some of these things that we got SAX data from in the test expression, it was like the faintest line on an SDS page. And did we get SAX on it? Yeah. Yeah, we got some of them. Well, that was after I scaled up. Right. And then, okay, okay. Yeah, I think for most of these, it was two liter preps. I'm impressed, sorry, you will continue that. How difficult was this data collection comparing to previous five years that we worked with Patrick? Yeah. Yeah. So the form twos are very nice to work with as compared to these. Uh, like these, this whole set was essentially uh, selected by uh, Patrick and Ohm and I uh, because of just how weird they are. Like it, we were essentially hunting for weird things and didn't know what we were going to find. And it turns out we got the simplest answer, which is kind of like a beauty and simplicity type of thing. But you were supposed to continue about this protein. Wait, are you doing this on campus? Uh, so I do all of the expression and purification in Davis. In Davis. Uh, and then I drive the samples up usually morning of and Usually we get them running pretty soon um, because there was a, in the beginning, we were having a lot of stability issues and essentially in the time that we were waiting for the samples to run, depending on like maybe something happened with the beam line and they had to sit overnight, they would all crash out. Uh, so worked very closely with everybody here and everybody was very nice and helpful uh, to getting the samples before they decided they didn't want these samples anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a question on chat. Uh -huh. Susan? Oh, yeah, no, I can ask it. it really nice talk. Um, Thank you. I have a speculative question, uh, which is could the dimer state uh, be an intermediate in its function? So, actually, in the hexameric form, that's sort of like a resting state, and then it goes into a High energy dimer state during its, you know, while it's working. Um, there's some evidence of this specifically in the form two three rubiscos. I don't know if you can see me pointing at the screen, but the light blue clade. Uh -huh. um, and essentially, what they do is whenever they're in an unbound state, uh, they're actually a dimer, and then when they're bound, they form this uh, decameric state. I see. I see. Okay. Um, we do have bound and unbound for all 18 of them, um, but I'm only showing the bound here just to simplify the figure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I think it's time for. Um, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we've switched to using ancestral enzymes in all of our work, and they're much easier to work with. They're mm -hmm. thermostable. They can be expressed without chaperones. Uh, we've benefited a lot from using them. So, 
think it's a good way to good direction to go. Thank you.